you will not get through all the slides. I was a little, I specifically try to give a little too much information to the slides, get through what we can. I wanted to make sure you guys have a lot of good information to take back. So how many of you guys are, is there anybody in the room that's an IT auditor? They're not here. They're not supposed to <laughs> well, we, Grace was here in the last class, and he, he gave us some insight. Uh, how many of you guys know enough about IT to be dangerous? A couple of you guys? All right. So just feel free to chime in throughout. This course, I teach this course more than any other course that I teach out of the 170. There seems to be just a, a, a hunger for good IT audit knowledge, and I teach it from the perspective of a non-IT auditor. I'm a CPA, I'm, an, I'm a financial operational auditor. I had to self-teach myself a lot of this stuff over the last 10 years, so very similar backgrounds to, to y'all's backgrounds. So what's our responsibility? What's our knowledge base and necessary as an IT auditor, as an auditor in regards to IT? What knowledge should we have? What are y'all's thoughts? Understand how computer works. Say again? Understand how computer works. Properly. Understand how a computer works? I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good starting point. What else? What else? What do we need to know about IT as an auditor? Processes. Their process. The process in general, even think higher level. What else? Good start. Yes, sir. The user access. User access, yes. I'm even thinking even more general than that, but I agree with everything you said. From an audit perspective, on any audit we do, Risk. we've got to understand the objectives, the risks, and then we can identify the controls. Regardless if it's a business process, operation review, IT system. You still got to start with that objective and the risk. If you look at the red book, it says internal auditors must have sufficient knowledge of key information technology risk controls, regardless of your level. So we're going to talk specifically about how to identify key risks and again some of the basics that maybe you won't know how to do the auditing, but you'll know you need to call in somebody for some assistance. It's really the ability to recognize those red flags to make sure we're getting those questions answered. Have you guys heard of the GTAG series? Global Technology Audit Guides? Raise your hand if you've heard of those. Just a couple. So if you're an IA member, those are 100% free, We're included with your membership, and there are 17 of them. You can't read this, but it's a guidance very simple guidance from the IT, um, the IA. Very good guidance. If you come across a subject that you're not aware of, you're unsure of, I would go to the IA website and check out these G tags. Very good information, very well written, and again, completely uh, complimentary or included with your membership. So we're going to cover a couple things that are covered by some of the G tags, specifically in G tag one. GTAG 1 covers Category 1 knowledge, which is knowledge for all IT needed, knowledge of IT needed by all professional auditors, from staff all the way to CE. So this next slide, I'm going to give you guys a minute to read it. This is what all auditors should have at, at a basic level of knowledge for IT. We're going to ask you guys who's got that level of knowledge. Here in a minute. How many of you guys would say that you've got this level of knowledge? Raise your hands. They don't like raising hands anyway. I've already raised them. <laughs> but I appreciate it, Maggie. Thank you. Maggie. Mm -hmm. Did I get that right? Yeah. What do you not understand up here? If you don't have this level of knowledge, tell me what, what you're not you're not fluent in or you you have questions on me. 
Anybody? Understanding IT risk without necessarily uh, possessing the significant technical knowledge. We're going to specifically talk to that on the next slide. Do you need technical IT knowledge to understand the risks? Depends. <laughs> you did that on purpose, I think. No, no, no. Tell me more. In Volition, every day we have new systems uh, in different areas. So if I don't know the system, I don't know what is the risk. Because I have to understand the whole process to audit. So. All right, let me challenge that real quick. Do you have to understand the whole process in order to audit? If I'm, in the sense, if I'm auditing, uh, say, uh, procurement system, I should know how the data goes in and how it processes and uh, key uh, control points. If I don't know, uh, let me say this, guys. I'm in no way saying not knowing the system. Knowing the system is always going to be a good idea. Knowing the process is always going to be a good idea. But I, do I have to have detailed knowledge of how the system works in order to audit it? I don't think you can. I don't think you have to have it. I think you can have a good overview to understand the objectives, the risks, and controls. Does, does that make sense? So I, it's a balance there. Do you need... Significant, uh, tech, significant technical knowledge to understand the risks? I don't think you need it at all. It could be an added advantage. It's, a, it's definitely a good idea, but none of us in this room, we've already shown, have that technical knowledge. That doesn't mean we can't audit an IT system. Does that make sense? I'm gonna keep proving that point. But how many, yes ma'am? I was gonna say, I think it depends on what kind of risk you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair, but let me let me show you guys this. There's a lot of similarities between regular general auditing, financial operational auditing, and IT audit. And so I always start with the assertions because I think that's a it's a good jumping off point to understand: Do we have all the risks? Do we have all the controls covered? If you compare the right side to the left side, there's a whole lot of similarities there. So I agree with you theoretically. But if, I mean, again, we can talk, we'll talk about these here in a second. These are all interwoven, interlinked to an extent. If you understand the objectives of IT auditing, I think you'll be able to at least understand the approach how to audit. You might not be able to do some of the technical aspects, but you should be able to put your arms around it. Does that make sense, guys? Yes. So let me ask you guys this. Have you guys, anybody in here ever audited uh, uh, Firewall configuration. Anybody here ever audited firewall configuration? Yes. To make sure it's configured correctly. Probably no. No. How many of you guys feel confident that you could do that? Come on, somebody raise their hand. Take. Yes. You think you could get there? So what's the first what's the first step in auditing a firewall configuration. And the only reason I bring this up, it kind of goes back to your question. Good audit technique should apply to every audit no matter the time. So what's the first step of this audit? What's the first step of any audit? Say it again? Before we talk to them, I agree with you. Talk to the techie person, I like that even better. But even before that, right? What's the first document we should get? The user manual? Security manual. User manual, security manual, even more general. IT policy? IT policy. Should be, there's going to be a firewall, should be a firewall configuration policy. So the first document we're going to get is that firewall configuration policy. Then there should be some standards outlined in the policy. I want to, I want to understand where they got those standards. So policy against leading practice, make sure I understand why we're doing the things we're doing. And then we talk to the, the people that are doing it. And then we verify that they're, if, it, if it's in accordance with leading practices, we're going to verify the standards against the policy. That's any operational audit we've ever done, right, guys? Does that make sense? 
So if you take that approach, we can audit anything. Now, if we get into the technical configurations, et cetera, you know, there might be some stuff where we raise the hand and, and say we need an IT specialist to do some of this stuff. But the overall approach, the risks, I think a lot of these we should be able to determine regardless of our IT exposure or not. So if you look at these guys, do a little, we're doing a little matching exercise between financial and operational versus IT. Which one of these is familiar to each other or similar to each other? Which makes sense to match them across? Any suggestions? Always be the first one to respond because it's the easiest answers. <laughs> <laughs> Say again, authorization and integrity versus authorization. So let's just stick with authorization for a second. You can say authorization from this side, integrity, probably security as well. I mean, you could stretch it a little further, maybe go to efficiency as well. There's a few different ways you could do that. Um, efficiency also goes to efficiency. efficiency? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always be first. Um, what else? What are some other matchings up here? I've heard this before where completeness goes to needs all of these. Accuracy, you need all of these in order to verify accuracy and, and so on and so forth. I, I can see that too. If I was looking at completeness, I would look at integrity, reliability as well. There's, uh, here's my general answer. I'm not saying this is perfect. But if you can see the similarities between the, uh, the left side, the audit approach, and the right side, you can do IT auditing. Because the principles of the same. Do you guys understand all the terms on the right side? Are there any terms that we don't understand? Scalability. What is scalability? As we grow as an organization, the system can grow without losing its effectiveness, without losing its speed of processing. So it can scale up versus scale down. I, have, I don't have that label, you're right, but I, this is an older version. Scalability, where would that go? I would put it towards efficiency right away, because again, if it's scalable, we're not gonna lose efficiency as we grow as an organization. You probably could put it to a few others, but I'd say scalability, efficiency, and effectiveness, for sure, would be attached to scalability. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? All right, let's keep moving. How do you know if you have a good IT department? I think this is one of the inherent issues we have with IT. What's the, if you have a good IT department, they're doing what? That's my question to you guys. Say again? Responsiveness. Responsiveness, right? Very responsive. Uh, great, uh, great point. Uh, they keep the systems up and running. When you ping them, they're able to fix your issue, hopefully quickly. Other things? Are they contributing to the strategy, or let's take a step further, or meeting of the objectives of the organization. That's exactly what I was looking for. If the organization is successful, IT has a significant role in that success. Would you guys agree with that or disagree? Everything we do has an IT component. What do you do that doesn't have IT anymore, guys? I mean, I listen to my, my headphones when I'm working out. I sleep with a CPAP machine so I don't snore, everything I do has an IT component. So there's not much the organization can do from a success standpoint without IT. COVID, which is similar to COSO, I'm sure you guys have heard of COSO, is the IT um, framework for controls. It specifically tries to align business risk with your IT risk. 
Let's talk a little bit about controls. We're going to get through a few of the general controls. We're not going to get through a lot, but we'll, we'll hit the highlights. I, I kind of want to redefine what a control, a definition of controls is. Someone give me an example of a truly autom automated control. Any example of an automated control? Little um, human intervention, setup established, plug and play. Any example? So, security blockers, yes. Security blockers, yes. What else? Say it again. The what check? Oh, yes, through a match. Yes. So, we've set it up in the system for through a match. We will not pay unless we have through a match, right? So, it's, we've got to be able to prove, basically, and mark it off that we have through a match before it's paid. That's established in the system. Little human intervention after it's set up. Automated control. All right, let's shift to the other extreme, manual controls. What are, are there truly manual controls that you focus on as an auditor? What are some manual controls that you guys see? Say it again. Bank reconciliation, great example. Is that a manual control? I don't think it is anymore. Because, and then I'm, I'm glad you brought that up as an example, because we really focus on the person, the human, doing the reconciliation. But what are they doing the reconciliation off of? The bank? Our system? So there's an IT component and a business and, and a uh, human component. So to me, and I think that's what we got to look at, those are more dual controls versus truly manual. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah. I think we've always viewed them as manual, but if, if, if that person is reconciling off of a bad statement, off of bad system records, they probably don't even know it's an issue. So that's more of a dual control. I think what you see in most organizations, majority of controls are one of the three. Manual, dual, or automated. Dual. I'd say 60 to 70% of all controls that we utilize, that we call key, more dual controls. You've got to make sure you're capturing that automated component and testing that component. Manual controls, there's only a handful. We don't do any truly manual testing, not much anymore. And we have some automated controls. The systems are probably capable of more, but we haven't done a good job of establishing those truly automated controls using the system to its full capabilities. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? What about the password? <laughs> uh, password? Yeah. Change. Sometimes the system requires us to change the password. What password do? change, yes. Mm -hmm. So what is that? <laughs> Because sometimes it's still yeah. require us. In general, the password, establishing a password is an automated control. <laughs> but requiring it to change, yes, you've got that person that has to go in and change it. The system prompts you. But the system yeah. prompts you. I don't know if I'd call it dual or, or strictly automated, honestly. I'm not sure where I would put that. Because there's minimum human intervention in automated controls. I still think that's automated. Yeah, yeah. I think I still, yeah, yeah, I think that I would say that's more automated than a dual control. But thank you, I'm glad you brought that up. Great, great way to, uh, to look at. There's a lot of gray between the three categories. The reason I bring this up is this category, when we call it manual, we usually don't capture the IT component. We don't test it appropriately. It's important to make sure that we're testing that component. There's some different classifications. We're not going to focus on this. We're just going to focus on these two for now. Application versus general controls. You brought up through a match. Perfect example of an application control if it's set up in the system. My question to you guys, and if you can understand this theory, you'll get application controls. All right, let's go back 30, 40, 50 years. Through a match, we don't have an IT system. Everything is done manually. 
would that, would that control exist in some form or fashion regardless if we have an IT system or not? Would it exist? Yes or no? Yes. It would, wouldn't it? So application controls really have nothing to do with IT. They're business rules set up in the system. So if you're able to look at it that way, guys, application controls are easy to understand. These are good business controls, good business processes. That's it. So we're not gonna get into application controls, but if you always keep that in mind when you're identifying controls, it makes it a lot easier. General controls. Someone give me a, a simple analogy or an explanation of, not, not an example, but an explanation of what a general control is. You're trying to explain this to a kid or an intern. What's a general control? General computer control. Any ideas? I've got two different analogies that I think work well. And we'll, make, we'll go further to define what a general control is. The one I heard that I really like, I still like mine better, but this one's pretty good. It's uh, general controls are the roots to the tree. The tree is all the systems that we have. The roots are the general controls, meaning the system doesn't feed, the system doesn't grow, the system isn't most importantly reliable if we don't have good roots helping to feed the tree. I like my analogy, I like a house analogy. <coughs> the general controls are the foundation of your home. Someone mentioned in the last class the electricity too of the home. The home is wonderful, it's beautiful, but if I have a foundation that's cracking and breaking, I can't use the home, can I? I can have all these beautiful TVs, Great hardwood floors, great furniture, but it doesn't work. I can't use it unless the foundation is strong and the electricity is working. So the general controls support everything in the IT spectrum. I think one thing we didn't mention in the other class that you've got to make sure, and this is a great question to ask, does your process, does the audit under review, is everything managed by IT, central IT? Or is it managed by the business? Why does that matter? General controls, in most cases, are gonna to apply to what IT manages. But if IT doesn't manage the system, I'm gonna say this and I don't know if it applies to you guys. I don't think IT cares unless they manage it. They're not responsible for it. They're not accountable for it, so they don't care. Yeah. You agree with that? Yes. It's sad but true. So I think that's a great question to ask because if there are systems that IT isn't managing, I really don't know if they're gonna have good controls or not. So what are some examples of good gen or general control? We've got four different categories <coughs> based on COVID of IT general controls. We're gonna to talk to the first two or three, depending on the amount of time we have. And someone in class over the past year, I was going through this long spiel about general controls and they said, look, boil it down for me. What are the most two important <coughs> general controls? What are the general controls you can't live without? What do you guys think? What are some of the general controls that if I pass it, it uh, you can't live without? You've got to have them in order to have integrity of the data of the system. Any ideas? I hear some whispers. Sam Louder. Anybody? <coughs> Say it again. Application access controls. So access controls. Now, access, I maybe lump in almost segregation of duties with that. People have to have access to the right things. If they have too much access, guess what they can do? Cause harm, steal, et cetera. We'll talk more about that, but people need to have the appropriate access to the, to the right systems, and once they get access to those systems, 
the appropriate duties based on their job responsibilities. There's one other one I think you can't live without. Company. Can you elaborate? I, I, you're, I think you're on to it. What do you mean completeness? I, I think we're going to say similar things right now. Um, he said completeness. I've got to be able to, as an auditor, understand what's happened to the system over that period. So the completeness of the changes. The other piece is change control. If I don't understand what changes have been made to the system, guys, you cannot audit the system. I think you can, but it's very time consuming and I don't know if you want that approach. So I would say access and change control are the two general controls that if you don't have them, I don't know if you can rely on the data. I, the data integrity, to me, comes into question. Raise your hand if you don't know what change control is, or you would like a definition, a further definition. Raise your hand if you understand what change control is. Since nobody raised their hand the first time, everybody should raise their hand the second time. This is your completeness control. That's, yeah, there was, yeah, there was no completeness check. It did not work at all. So what is change control? Are you referring to audit trail? Say again? Audit trail. That's an easy way for auditors to understand it. It's going to be, and it's a little more than that, but it's your audit trail. It's going to be anything that's been uh, modified in the system, altered in the system. We've got a regimented, organized, step-by-step -step process in order to get those changes into the system. But it's an audit log. That's the starting point, the crux of change control. Access right. Access right for different users. So who, who have, access rights will fit into it from a new system or a new module perspective. Um, not necessarily from the change control. Is it this? Well, I mean, if you give everyone an admin user, oh. they can change everything. Oh, uh, yeah, a different subject. Yeah, I agree with you okay. there. Um, we're not gonna we're not gonna hit on that too much. That kind of goes back to her comment on access. People have to have access to the right things. If you look at the last ten years and the major frauds that have occurred, a lot of it had to do with access rights. People had too much access. So let's talk about access. Most organizations strive for, there's basically two modules of access rights or segregation of duties. Role-based and an individual model. An individual model would say, we have two people, they're in the same role, but they do different things. Everybody does special things, different things. So I've gotta give them access to the systems based on what, they're, what they do well, what they need access to. Or the other side, of, the other line of thought is, these are both senior accountants. I don't care how good they are, what they need access to, senior accountants have access to this. They get access based on their responsibilities, their role. What do you guys have at, at, at here? Is it? Role-based or is it more of an individual model? Do you guys know? Role-based. Role-based. And you guys have 43,000 employees, but a lot of them do not, a good section of them don't have access to systems. Is that, that there were minimal access, is that correct? Not all of them need a lot of access. It's, it's hit and miss. Okay. Um, I would say that every organization strives for a role-based model. What you usually have is a hybrid model where you try to keep that role-based but then you have a lot of one-offs from there. It's very difficult to really, truly manage a good role-based model. But when I have a new user on a system and I'm doing an audit, if I have truly a role-based model, the segregation of duties have already been worked out. You're not gonna have, if you're a senior accountant and you're a senior accountant, we've already minimized the exposure we have from a lack of segregation of duties. If you don't have that, then you've got to look at each user and what they have access to. So you could go from a 43,000 employee company and have 500, 1,000 profiles, let's say, or basically 43,000 profiles from a 
administrative standpoint, it's a huge difference. So role-based is the way to go. I don't know how, uh, how easy that is to actually apply it and um, stick to it, stick to a strict role-based model. Um, let's stick with provisioning and deprovisioning. Provisioning is a fancy word for what? Getting access. So provisioning is giving access to users. Guess what deprovisioning is? <gasps> How'd you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Removing access from the system. So if we are a strict role-based model, pretty easy to give access. The uh, manager will approve it, IT will go into the system, or sorry, IT will make sure they get uh, approval from the system owner, and they give them access based on their role. What about deprovisioning? How quickly should you be taken off a system? Immediately? Or when they see the design. Say it again? Design or they Well, it, it, after, after notice? Yes. Usually, it, policies say timely a lot of times. As to what timely is, <laughs> different, there's different interpretations of that. But from an IT perspective, if someone is, if their last day was Friday, or going to be, yeah, let's say last Friday, uh, access to single sign-on or Active Directory, and I think you guys, based on the other class, use this. Single sign-on means it's the front door to our house. If I open the door, I have access to all the other rooms in the house. Your applications are all tied to one sign-on. Once I shut that down, do not have access to those uh, systems. Do you have a comment? Sorry, I saw a hand pop up. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, when we were talking about uh, the provisioning of access, is it deleting it or freezing it? So, provisioning of assets, are we talking about deleting it or freezing it? Um, if someone has been terminated, You'd like to think that you're going to delete them out of the system. A lot of times they are inactivated or deactivated because why? Because maybe their manager needs access to what they were doing, emails, etc. So for, uh, for an interim period, usually it's going to be inactive or deactivated. Eventually they should be terminated as users, but you usually see a disconnect there. They're deactivated and never take that next step. So great question. Does, does that make sense? What about transfers? I transfer from one department to the next. From an IT standpoint, how should that be handled? Change. Change. So just change the roles. Any other ideas? This is done wrong all the time. Yes. So, and I think I know where you're going with this. Basically, cut off their rights from the old position and then reprovision their rights based on the new provision. Is that where you're going? So, basically, you terminate them as a user and you reprovision them. That's the right way to do it. Why? When you add on based on a, uh, a transfer, we forget to cut off those rights. Going back to your comment. They probably need them for the interim period, maybe to train somebody, their replacement, and they're never cut off. Guess what happens? Now they have too much access. Now there's a lack of segregation of duties. So a lot of the things we talk about from a fraud perspective, if, if, you, if you segregate duties correctly, you're going to decrease non-collusive fraud opportunities significantly. Yes, ma'am? In some cases, we will just uh, remove that right for some file on the server because they are asked to design in some period. So whenever it's known, they are not allowed to delete any documents and, yeah. and emails yeah. and all these things. Yeah, no, I've heard that too, that you almost have a moratorium on what they can do yeah. until they leave. Yeah, that totally makes sense. It's just the policy needs to be well written and IT needs to follow their policy when that occurs. And again, it doesn't happen very often that it's done right. Please? Yes, what, sir. What about uh, delegation? 
Delegation of authority, yeah. rights, yes. etc. That's a big problem as well because we'll delegate, like maybe I'm responsible for authorization, but I delegate that right to you. Yeah. I forget about it too. <laughs> so you might change roles. We never take that away. That's another, it just, it adds to the puzzle. And again, if IT, this kind of goes back to, we're gonna talk about culture next. We talked about it this morning. If I request something and I'm the top person in the organization, IT should push back and say, no, you can't do that because it's not in line with this policy. What happens? IT doesn't push back. And they say, sure, since you're Mr. So-and-so, that's what you want, that's what you'll get. A good culture would support IT or other lower level positions or organizations saying, no, that's not within policy. Versus a more command and control structure would say, you're gonna do it because I said so. So great question on delegation. It happens all the time because it's a major problem. Yes, sir. Uh, it's a question. Uh, from where I used to work for, uh, fraud, fraud in banking sector usually happens because uh, IT is a super user, it's not business user. The super users in the system are not business users, they are IT. And most of the fraud, they are the one who are perpetrating those frauds <laughs> in the database. They are changing. Things in. Now, uh, yeah. I would like to, to see, uh, to, to give you to comment, who should be the super user? Is it the business or the IT? So let's talk about super users and then let's talk about um, uh, managing the databases because that's the other part you brought up because that's, that's something we're going to talk about. Great question. Um, a lot of fraud does occur from the super user standpoint. How many super users or admins should there be in a system? Should it be one? Why? I think two is reasonable, but I'm going to say the answer. I don't like the answer. It depends. <laughs> it depends on the system, the number of users, but I think one or two. You usually have two because you want to back up. But what's key is even if you have super users, admins, they've got to be uniquely identifiable. So if I have a super user, and the other part, when we talk about change control, anything you do in the system, there's a log of that. They can't erase the log. So no matter who's doing what, at least I know what's happening and I can track it back. So you should need the super users. You can have super users, only a minimal amount, but you've gotta be able to uniquely identify those users and what they're doing. Now, and this is something we we're gonna bring up later, but let's talk about it now, is the concept of the master file. You've got a customer master, vendor master, employee master. What's a master file? It's your source data. It's your source file where systems are going to pull from, uh, regardless of, uh, of, of what, they're, what they're using. Your vendor master, AP, should be pulling from the vendor master. If you protect your master files, you make it very difficult to commit fraud. So let's talk about vendor master, perfect example. It's hard to get into the vendor master. It's easy to get, um, I lost the word, not terminated, deactivated from the vendor master. Sorry about that. If we protect the vendor master, and that's the only way that we can get paid as a vendor, You've eliminated, you've reduced your risk of fraud significantly. Here's the problem that's inherent in that, uh, in that situation. We don't protect the vendor master. It's very easy to get into the vendor master. You know what it takes most of the time? It's a letter and a number in the US, a W-9 form that shows that you're an organization. That's all you need a lot of times. I don't know, I, I don't know how y'all's works, but we should be vetting out our vendors before we use them. But we don't. We let vendors in the master file. We don't get rid of them when they're not being used. Collusion can occur, and I might be able to write a check to a vendor that hasn't been used in years before, but I write the check and I change the address to me. I get the check, I can cash it. So if you protect those master files, 
you're doing a, a lot of fraud prevention. Again, there's some breaks in that theory. I know some organizations have a one-time vendor use where you can put in a vendor, to, you don't even have to put them into the vendor master file, but you can write a check to the vendor if you have a one-time exemption. That's an awful idea. Because at this client that does this, they use the one-time vendor all the time. So you really have no track of who you're writing checks to except for the check and not the vendor master file. Or manual checks, which most companies don't write many manual checks anymore, which is good. If you don't write manual checks, you don't have one-time exemptions, you have to go through the vendor master file in order to get paid. That's your primary fraud deterrent right there, or fraud prevention, potentially. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of folks don't fully understand that. Fraud is easy to prevent or reduce if you've got good controls where they're needed. Everything I just described, there's one way you can circumvent the vendor master file still. There's still one way to get paid without being in the vendor master. Do you guys know how to do that? Someone said it. Uh, advances, we should not, uh, advances are a dangerous game too. Because if, uh, you could give advances travel advances and never travel. You know, so those have got to be tracked very closely. Someone said it. P card, travel card. You can run things through your credit card. A lot of people try to hide things in their expenses. Um, I get paid by clients on credit card pretty routinely. Um, so it's, it's not completely uncommon. It's not illegal, but it's another way you can circumvent the process without get paid without being the better master. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Questions on that? Someone mentioned earlier the audit logs, the system logs. System logs come with what type of systems? System logs come with off-the-shelf software, third-party developed software. So great question to ask every time you're going into an audit. Your system of record, is it internally developed or is it purchased by a third, or from a third party? Why does that matter? Third-party software is developed not only for function, but control. So there's going to be basic controls that are inherent in that software that are going to be pretty reliable in most cases. If people, why do people internally develop software? Instead of buying, they develop. Why? Say again? Cost. Usually it ends up costing more, but I would agree. It's, it's because it costs. Why else? Fun control functionality. To meet so many uh, of their needs. Yeah, to, it, 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 from their perspective, I can't buy something that truly meets my needs. And I, I would disagree with that in most cases because there is great software out there, but that's the perspective. People build software for functionality, not control. Most, uh, most internally developed software, quite frankly, has almost no control. There's no user levels. There's no access rights from what I've seen. There's very few. Now, you can put in those controls after the fact, but those initial few years without this being pointed out, you really have no controls over that system, which brings up a whole, whole other bevy of potential risks. So a great question to ask is third party or internally developed? Now, if they purchase the software, you should be asking if it's Configured or customized? Is there a difference? Well, yes, because there's two different words, two different names. <laughs> What's the difference? Which is worse for a risk standpoint? Customized. customized. Why? 
software helps you to customize it according to your needs. You basically change, when you say customize, you change the functionality of the system to fit your needs. Why does that matter? So you might lose some control, but let's take it a step further. Let's say we, we buy an off-the-shelf software, but we customize it. The next upgrade, the next version, it's not free anymore. You've got to pay to upgrade your customization. What do most companies do? They don't pay. So what are you doing? You're running off an old version, of a, an antiquated version of a software that's three, four, five, six, six years old. So if they're buying off-the-shelf software, configuring is just making it work within the normal boundaries, normal spectrum. Customization is a whole different risk in itself. If you hear either internally developed software or customized third-party software, that should be a yellow or orange flag, orange light going off, saying, hey, I've got some additional potential risk that I've got to consider. Make sense? Any questions? Let's talk, uh, let's spend a couple minutes on change control. We've got just a few minutes left as it is. Um, change control, we talked about what that is. The starting part, if you, how many of you guys have audited change control before? Raise your hand. Nobody. How many of you guys think you could audit change control? <laughs> One person maybe? Did you do that because you think it or just feel bad for me? So you raise your hand. <laughs> okay, appreciate that. <laughs> Let's go back. How would you audit change control? What's the first step? Yeah. Understand the, the policy. So when we get the policy first, right? I'm going to understand what change control looks like. These are, um, uh, let's see here. These are system development methodologies or system development life cycle steps. Is very, change control is part of it. We're going to make sure we understand what we're doing. We're going to test it. We're going to verify it. We're going to get approval by the business before we move into production. And then we're going to verify it's working after the fact. That's really, in general, what change control is. I'm going to get the policy. And then I'm going to get, someone mentioned earlier, the audit log for the system. So I can verify the completeness of change control against the audit log. And then I'm going to make sure they're doing what they said they did or should do when they have a change that comes up. Honestly, I, I'm oversimplifying it, but not by much. It should be that straightforward from a methodology standpoint. Any questions on change control? What kind of changes should go through change control? Upgrades. What else? Upgrades, updates, versions, shifts, table changes, everything. Except, and you might have different levels of change control. Maybe you'd have it more in depth for an update or a new version versus a small table tweak, depending on your organization. The only thing that's perceived as a change that doesn't go through change control is what we just talked about new users provisioning. That's not a system change, that's a user change. All system related changes should go through some form of change control. What about, what about changing master data? So you change the master data file, great question. Um, there, there should be some type of log, and you, you might not go through a change control, but we were talking about who should control the master data file. It should be a group that's segregated possibly in IT that controls master data. So it's not going to be your normal IT folks that are helping with the administration of the system. There's going to be a master data group. So the business would request, let's say, a change to an address. Um, they'll go through the authorization if necessary, and IT will manage that, or that IT group will manage it. But there should be a tracking of master data changes as well. Because again, you could really manipulate, you can manipulate the master file, you can steal. 
Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you, you mentioned something like that now. I'm just thinking, when we're talking about um, change something, do we need to have authorization before we go into the system to, uh, uh, to bring it up? Do you need authorization yeah. to yeah. 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 make the changes? Yeah. Okay, the only people that are gonna be making uh, these type of changes to the system through change control are the people he mentioned earlier, the privileged users, the super users, the admins, those are gonna be, be the people that are gonna do those changes. If we're in the business, we're gonna request it, we're gonna understand the testing, we're gonna make sure it's working, but we're not gonna make the changes, and that's, uh, pretty uh, basic segregation of duties. System users, system owners, should have access to make changes to the system. Super users off the shelf software we talked about. This next slide is on database implementation, which is, again, the master file, which we talked about. Again, I wanna reiterate, we're not gonna get through everything. Uh, the slides will be available for you guys. If you have any other questions, that we didn't go through, please email me. I'd be happy to uh, trade emails and discuss, not an issue whatsoever. Yeah. Yes? COVID? COVID guidelines, okay. At what point should you consider them? Immediately. Now, uh, uh, and and let, let me explain a little bit more. If you have been audited, if you've had an external audit of your financials, your IT department should know what COVID is because th that's really the auditing standard. If they've never heard of COVID, <laughs> it is. That would be, or, or if it's not maybe COVID, maybe they're using an ISO framework. As long as you're using some type of business uh, framework, IT controlled framework, you're okay. But if they've never heard of it, you're gonna have to take a step back. There are checklists out on the internet you can research. Probably, uh, I think if you Google COVID, COVID questionnaire or COVID checklist, this will give you kind of the basic standards. But all COVID is is guidance. It says something like, you must have passwords for each user. It doesn't give you the specifics on what you should do, how long they should be, it just says you must. So it's very, very basic standards. So to me, if they've never heard of COVID or ISO or NIST, NIST, that's a red flag. Did I answer your question? So with that guys, it is 3.45. Like I said, we're not gonna get to everything. I want to point one other thing out. This engagement level IT risk assessment, these are simple yes, no questions you can ask and have a good understanding, do you have a lot of risk in IT within five minutes? You could send out a questionnaire. Out of everything that I teach on an annual basis, this exercise gets built in an um, organizational audit methodology more than anything else. Because these are very simple questions. You can get to know a lot about the risk of any organization or any system just by asking simple questions. So again, those slides will be available to you, but I did want to point that out. I think it's something very worthwhile that you should take a look at. Um, uh, do, you, uh, do you have a disaster recovery plan or a business continuity plan? Either one. Yeah, we didn't get as deep as I'd like on a lot of these subjects. No, they have so they are not using Everybody's cloud based? Uh, it's. Uh, yeah, and, and even even if it is, I, I'm with you, it's cloud based, but we still got to make sure that there's a plan that we can, which like comes to your BCP. A, what do you follow up? They didn't have the ERP, but now they are saying, oh, we are not doing ERP now, it's uh, version is not cloud based. Is, is it everything? Yeah. Everything? At least. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and I don't know if I like that Not answer. I know. You know, they're basically pushing the risk onto the third party. It's still, I've got to make sure those those files are recoverable quickly. So I, I would ask them. So you cannot have the internet connection. Yeah, I think that's, 
it sounds like they use cloud-based uh, um, methodology just to yeah check the box versus really thinking about what they're doing. So that's a great opportunity to follow up. So with that, guys, again, high level. Guys, IT auditing is not as difficult as you might think. Apply good audit methodology, understand the basics, and then we can bring in specialists as we need. But don't fear IT, because it's everybody in the room over the next 6, 12, 18 months should be able to undertake something like this if you, if you open your mind to it and understand those key concepts we talked about before. Thank you very much. Thank you.